Welcome to the fifth preseason Super Coach Coach podcast season 2021. We are back with two returning longtime guests of the show, Dunny and Faz, now coming to you via YouTube in probably not HD, standard definition. <laughs> Welcome back, fellas. Good to be here. Thanks, Marcus. Good to be back. So for this episode, we are going to cover a bit of a recap on the preseason games. We've got one per team and we'll have just a brief chat about that. We can leave it reasonably light there because the main show this week is all about the rookies. And if you've been following our community for a while, Faz has a long-standing tradition of being the rookie guru amongst us and no pressure, but if there's any hard questions, it's going one way. A lot of blame coming my way, I can feel it. <laughs> and then after that, we're going to record a Patreon special as well. Talk about some of our teams in a little bit more detail because we're, uh, I think, seven days from lockout at time of recording. This time next week, we'll be f- busy figuring out whether or not uh, we want to be carrying rookie risk, etc. cetera, uh, and pulling our hair out, no doubt. So without further ado, quick plug for patrons and we'll get into it. Patreon.com forward slash supercoachcoach if you want some bonus content. Mark and I will pick our cookie cutter team as is tradition now this weekend. He's just been a bit full up with some stuff this week, but uh, we're going to release that on the weekend and uh, try and fit in another recording with Mark as well on the weekend. So more bonus content coming that way. There's the Super Coach Coach group prize uh, for the people who have joined up and subscribed into the group. So 200 bucks to the highest finisher for the year is a, a nice little thank you. Uh, and congratulations for the top scorer in our community, which is pretty exciting. And priority sort of questions, et cetera, are being asked. And we've been enjoying ourselves doing a bit more extra content for the Patreon. So the content's gotten longer compared to prior seasons, and we'll look to expand that even more moving forward in the regular season. So head on over if you want to support us. Otherwise, get involved in our Discord channel as well if you'd like. Again, all the links are either in the YouTube description below or on your podcast uh, feed. The details should be within the podcast notes themselves. All right. So a quick chat about the preseason games. Gents, how many games did you end up watching? Any particular fallouts? I suppose Zach Williams is a a big topic of uh, contention now that he's rubbed out for one game, whether or not you try and hide him on the bench considering the no backline rookies to to speak of. Danny, anything come to your mind watching the preseason games? I think watching the games just made me more confused and uh, trying to work out who was who and all these rookies to look at. But uh, I guess for me, the thing was really looking at who actually played, who didn't play and what role these guys had because it's not about so much how many points they score in the preseason is about what role they have and are they going to have that role going forward. And like, uh, like everyone else watching within the first uh, minute of that first game, oh, there goes our most obvious pick in the back line. He's done out for round one. So, yeah, losing Williams, you know, it's just another lock that you've got to find someone else for. I guess the other hard thing about the preseason games was just the, the subbing on and the subbing off of players you know, halfway through. And some of the rookies I wanted to watch only got like half a game. So I don't know about you guys. I was... Really looking mm. forward to seeing your full games out of some of these guys and for the money to get a half made it hard to judge. Are they going to play? Are they, have they got a good role? What did you think about that, Faz? Did that make it harder for you? Yeah, it certainly did with uh, only getting a half game out of a lot of our rookies, really. I, there, there were very few that seemed to play the full game. I think I agree with Zach Williams has probably got a line through him now, particularly given he plays the first game of round one. So if he was playing later in the weekend, you could be Tempted to keep him there as a bit of a rookie loophole. But yeah, I think he comes out of the team. For me, it was also getting more tempted by the mid prices, as happens every preseason. We had Phillips at Hawthorne after moving across from Collingwood. I think he came into my side briefly. Jai Caldwell, who I'd talked myself out of, took myself back into him for a bit and took myself back out of him at that one still on the fence. And Dom Tyson's looking pretty good at North Melbourne as well. That was the, probably the takeaway for me over the weekend that I've still got a bit of uh, training to do to get the mid prices out of my system. I've been playing this game for so many years now, but that still every year they come back and tempt me. 
Danny, are you on the fence at all about Zach Williams or is he uh, a non-starter for you? Definitely a non-starter for me, unfortunately. Like, like Faz, if he'd been playing Sunday night and we saw, say, a, a Tom Heim or, or someone like that come out and score like a, an 80 before then, yeah, I'd, I'd consider leaving him in as that rookie loophole. But no, I think at the moment you've got to leave him out, which which hurts. But yeah, I guess the way to look at it is if we bring in someone else, let's say Jake Lloyd, and we know he's got that sort of slight knee issue at the moment, if he plays round one and actually hurts himself, you know, it's an easy trade back down to Zach Williams. Or you know, if one of these others like Tom Stewart or one of the other popular defenders actually hurts himself or something happens in the first couple of weeks, it's an easy trade back down to Zach Williams. So he's there as a bit of a... A safety net. And that's probably the other thing to think about this year, which is different to last year. We've gone back to having two games to look at someone before their price changes, not the one that we had last year. It gives us a couple of weeks to get him in if we want to. Really good call around looking at him as a backup. A fantastic side swap if any of your mid prices don't turn out, uh, especially with people picking Rory Laird, mostly in the back line with the lack of rookies. You also have potentially the opportunity to pivot out of your midfield into him as well. I think maybe the other thing that would have me recommending people not pick him is just the injury history. If he's a guy that you can reliably say, hey, he'll play 21 regardless, post that one suspension, then you'd be a lot more confident and comfortable. But the way he plays and with his injury potential seems to pull some soft tissues relatively frequently. So that's not something that you really want to be exposing yourself to. If he misses the first game and then gets injured early in the season, you've potentially lost a lot of the potential value generation that's on offer. Begrudgingly agree because I was very much looking forward to bringing him in. But one other interesting thing I think that came out Maybe not just from the preseason games, but with the rookie availability and some commentary around who's going to be playing where, and especially with St. Kilda and and, uh, Paddy Ryder as well, taking some personal leave. The ruck situation is all of a sudden looking a lot more interesting. Not going Gorn Grundy is going to be a, a challenging one, but you've got now multiple potential rookies such that you can potentially play one of them on field to start round one. And obviously that's risky, but in a year where we're struggling to find rookies as well, certainly something that is going to tempt quite a few. Faz, how have you seen those ruck stakes? Have you made a change at all to see what your team would look like? I haven't done it yet because I don't want to tempt myself seeing how much better the side will look without. It's probably going to be Grundy would be the one that would make way in, in my side. And if you went Grundy down to... Paul Hunter, Matthew Flynn is probably the combo I was looking at. That's a hell of a lot of money you get from the the Grundy downgrade. It's was it six hundred thousand, just about five fifty, and you can do a hell of a lot there. That's potentially two top end rookies up to bona fide premiums. I am still a little shaky on it though. The injury that Marshall has at, at St Kilda, I thought it was a more long term, but this week Ratten was talking about Marshall saying. Not going to play round one, but could be back as early as round two or round three. So that has me then a bit concerned about Paul Hunter. That's no good, boo. (laughs) Yeah, I'm being a bit of a buzzkill here, I think. But Matthew Flynn as well, who I think is probably going to play a fair bit of ruck for GWS this year. But he didn't play in the preseason, has a bit of an ankle injury. So then it's the question of does he get up for round one or do they go for, they go Kieran Briggs in round one. You could potentially get the two of them, but... Kieran Briggs is not available in the ruck line, so you'd be playing him down back. And then if, if there, there could be a week pretty early on where both Hunter and Flynn are, are not playing. And uh, as has been mentioned on the uh, podcast a couple of times already this preseason, mucking around with your rucks can you know be pretty disastrous, really. You, you can end up spending so many trades there. For that reason, I've just kept it the Gorn Grundy combo for, for the time being. We might get a bit more news. I think Flynn's probably the big one. If he is... A definite starter for round one. I could be tempted because uh, we've also got Meek at Fremantle. So there are some options for that R3 position. Uh, Dunny, I think you might have mentioned offline that, that you've had a bit of a different ruck setup this year. I think no Gorn, is that correct? I did start that way, Faz. You're right. My plan was always to go, and it probably still is, to go get a Grundy O'Brien. If I can start with those two, O'Brien saves you a heap of cash from Gorn. Having said that, I do actually have Gorn in my team at the moment after a little bit of restructuring today after chatting to a few people. But I, I think my approach will be 
if I've got the cash there to have gone in, I'll have him. But if I don't, uh, I'll probably stick with O'Brien. Last year, I was one of the ones who played around with the whole Naismith and Jacobs and, and all of that. And it just, you waste, and I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here with you, Marcus, you can waste so many trades in the ruck line. I know you and I have both done it a few times in the past and it, and it causes trouble. So I, I think really all those guys you were talking about there, Faz, Hunter and Flynn and Meek and those guys, for me, the only discussion is which one am I putting in R3? Yeah, there's no question that, I'll be going two of the big three on field. Personally, I'd like to see Hunter thrown back to the SANFL because it's left my local team without a Ruckman for the year. But I, I don't think he's going to be a long-term solution. As you said, I think it's going to be down to Meek or, or Flynn, I think would be the two that I'd be looking at. A lot of talk about, is it Treacy at, at Fremantle as well? A lot of people talking about him, whether you stick him in the forward line uh, or not. But yeah, I think Meek did a pretty mm. good job the other night. And for me, I think he's probably got that spot locked up until Darcy comes back. Yeah, that's the one I'm hearing a bit about as well is the Flynn-Meek combo. So it's going to be interesting. I think that I'm not actually as opposed to dropping a Gorn Grundy type. I'd probably go drop Gorn before Grundy personally, but I'm not as opposed to that. If you're picking up a rookie, I struggled a lot more with trying to figure out who the stepladder position player would be. I think Pitney last year, Draper, there, there were pain points trying to pick those breakouts, but a rookie is more a structural thing and I think has a lot more potential value generation. Again, it's very risky, but no guts, no glory. And I think that's, Something that's at least a little bit more palatable than a step ladder is, is building your team around the right rookies. We'll have a bit more of a chat about that, I'm sure, in future apps and in the Patreon special. So I won't labor that too much more because we've got a fair bit to cover. A couple of other talking points from the weekend. I want to look toward the top scoring players because I think there's a couple of interesting themes to talk about. Now, one is the Dogs-Demons game. There were only, I think, four players who scored 150-plus from the long weekend of games, three of which came from the Bulldogs, McRae, Bontempelli, Dunkley. Now, obviously, Trelaw not in yet, but you still had Libba there, you had Hunter there, you had Smith there. They all got a good amount of game time. And Bont, 198. Dunkley, 170. McRae, 158. Liberatore, 140. Absolutely went to town on points. And I know a lot of people left out Bulldogs players. The percentage ownership stats were reflecting that. Our advice reflected that. But after seeing this, there's a heck of a lot more super coaches bringing those players in prior to round one. Wanted to get your gents thoughts around your likelihood to start a Bulldogs midfielder and whether or not this high scoring points have, have changed anything. McRae, Bontempelli and Dunkley, they're probably the main ones that are talked about. Bont and McRae being fairly obvious, you'd pick them because they have proven to be top tier mid selections. Bont arguably still with upside left to show. McRae the most consistent over the last few years. And then Dunkley, you know, is he a no brainer in, in the forward line if he's getting that midfield time? I think McRae spent a bit of time potentially a little bit further back down the field, playing a little bit more defensive, doing some stuff out of the halfback as well. Is that more of a commitment for, for Dunkley? But then again, we, we haven't seen the Trelaw impact yet. Quite a bit to think about. Where has your head been at during the preseason around the, the Bulldogs players, Dunny? I don't have any of those guys. I've got Caleb Daniel, but I don't have any of the other Bulldogs players that you just mentioned in my team at the moment. I'm very much nervous about what their role is going to be. I did catch a bit of that game. I didn't see all of it, to be honest, but it did look like Melbourne weren't putting up a huge amount of defense against the Bulldogs for the bits that I saw. I just don't think they're going to score like that going forward, and I'm worried about the Trelaw coming into that side. If I was going to pick any of them, I'd probably pick probably pick Bontempelli and McRae. I'm still very nervous about Dunkley. I actually saw him take a ruck tap in the forward pocket uh, and Tim English was actually standing there and he was roving the ball. Uh, and I'm like, what's going on here? Why is this happening? Yeah, I'm a little <laughs> concerned by that. I don't think I'll be jumping on them, but Bontempelli would probably be the one that I'd look at because no matter where he plays, he gets his points generally. And he's just so hard to tag in that space. How about you, Faz? Have you got any of those guys in your side? Similar to you, Danny, I've only got Caleb at the moment sitting in the back line. I think he might have come in as the Zach Williams replacement for me. I didn't yeah. see a heap of the game myself, but... 
I would agree with your comments. Just from looking at the game, Clayton Oliver, Jack Viney and Angus Brayshaw all didn't play for, mm. for Melbourne on the weekend. So I feel like that's probably is reflected in the scores of the midfield there, that there wasn't a heap of pressure. You know, you're not going to see a lot of pressure in a pre-season game, even when the best players are out there, but particularly when arguably Melbourne's three best midfielders aren't playing. I think it was a bit of one-way traffic there for the Dogs. Uh, and I, I just... rude to Petrarca, but sure. <laughs> oh, that's true. Track, yeah, Brayshaw wouldn't, One wouldn't, man be able to, wouldn't be able to claim that mantle over track. No, uh, I think that those are good points and very much re- resonate with that. And I think if, if we feel this way and the rest of the general populace are moving toward those players, that's, I hope, a good thing. Hopefully we don't get burnt by this call. All right, the, the other big scorer from the weekend, and this one's pretty thematic around the rule changes. So interesting to hear your general thoughts about this as well. Jaden Short, 165 super coach, had 43 possessions and it was noticeable, wasn't it, on the weekend? The ability to run and gun off a stationary player has changed things. Yeah. I don't know if that always converts to super coach points for that player because the opportunity to handball to a running play is definitely there as well. So you might actually miss some of the points because the handball run and gun is definitely much more on. I I have seen and heard commentary around changes to the game to suit this run and gun, but the the whole thing was more open on the weekend. And there's a lot to extrapolate from that because preseason and pressure and whatever else. But how are you guys seeing the rule changes as it may affect the backline premiums? Especially considering, I think, there's relative inflation in the midfield that's probably higher than elsewhere on the ground. And the backline premiums certainly have been pretty tempting to most of the general Supercoach community across the preseason. Any of you changing your perspective on how you're picking your backline players or even considering Jaden Short? I forgot about him, but he's another that certainly came in over the weekend. I reckon probably everybody put some of the rookies just about to change places in the side over the weekend. And it certainly does seem like it's a lot easier to get that width coming out of the backline when you've got, as you said, a stationary man on the mark. He used to be able to crowd the space, usually crowd the corridor side, uh, force a long kick down the line. It's so much easier for them to go in either direction now for, from that kick. It, it will be very interesting to see how it plays out. I, I didn't think there are any real forward taggers in the preseason. Again, we wouldn't expect too much forward tagging in a preseason game. But that's where I wonder. I just can't see Jaden Shaw getting 35 kicks really uh, uh, once during the season. That's just phenomenal numbers. He's been a decent super coach scorer in the past, and that's you know reflected in his price. He's not particularly cheap. He's still over... $500,000. So you're not getting a huge bargain there, but it could be the way to go. And then probably has he questioning whether a Jake Lloyd is worth the extra bucks if there's going to be that inflation of scoring across the back line. Uh, I don't think Jake Lloyd's scoring is going to drop particularly, but it's really the delta at the moment is the reason that we're picking him, I think, because he's the clear number one in the back line. You say, well, I've, I've got to shell out and get him. If there's going to be more guys pushing up to that ultra premium scoring in the back line, particularly with Jake Lloyd with a bit of an injury niggle at the moment. He's the one that I've been questioning whether I spend the extra bucks there or do I get a few more value selections like a Jaden Short. That was the thing I noticed the most was that switch of play across the back line. I noticed that happened quite a lot. It's really freeing up and giving those easy points because they can get that width across the half back line. I think it'll definitely benefit guys like Caleb Daniel, etc., who do like to use the footy across that back line and the dogs like it in his hands, so I think he's probably one that will benefit. Jaden Short, I I agree with you, Faz. He's not going to score like that every week. They do have Hooli to come back into that side at some stage who will take some of those points away, but you know, he certainly looks like one that will be definitely worth having back there. So I think the new rule for teams who've got players who use the footy well and have got really good kicks, that's really going to benefit those guys because I think their efficiency should go up because they're not going to be rushed trying to take that kick in board they're going to have the time to actually spot up their target. That big, long kick across the ground is not going to get shut down. So I think we will see definitely a bump in the scoring for those guys across the half back line, like Lloyd, Liam Ryan, um, Short, Caleb Daniel, uh, Tom Stewart. I think those guys should see a bit of a bump in their scoring. So definitely a bit of a switch in points back there, I think, this season. That's what I'm thinking is going to happen anyway. It'd be a brave man woman to take that extrapolation forward to picking your entire team off that basis. But certainly 
some interesting signals already and it is really just a carry on of last year's transfer of points into the back line already. I think it's unprecedented this level of scoring in the back line through my years playing Supercoach. So I don't think it's too far a bow to draw to say that even though it's just one game, that potential could be on. I think the other part is that extra five metres from kick out will probably prove to, to be a, a difference maker as well beyond just the man on the mark rule because I saw, and whether or not they're just trialling this, but that extra five metres with a torpedo means you're basically at the halfway mark for a lot of these players already. And that changes the way that the ball is transitioned fairly significantly into now you're attacking half much more quickly and aggressively and therefore being able to press your defense up and reset your team defense further up the field. How that plays out in terms of points, et cetera, is still an interesting conundrum based on just one week of history. But I'm certainly encouraged by the fact that from a rookie point of view, we're going to be pushed to pick more premium selections in the back line anyway. So I think uh, that's probably not too bad a thing considering some of the change in, in rules for 2021. All right, that's uh, quite a bit of time spent probably overs ruminating on the weekend's results. So let's cross over quickly to the rookies. And so we're going to just run through the the back line and take it position by position. We're going to look at ownership stats for players under the price of the number one draft pick from last year, Nugel Hagen. In the back line, there's four players in above 30% of teams at the moment. Jacob Kozzi, Kozitsky, oh my God. The Thomas Highmore, Lachlan Jones, Will Gould. I think in terms of job security, we are worried potentially about most of these players, especially Gould, uh, which is disappointing because that's the second year in a row that uh, we might not see him come to fruition after being an early preseason hyped pick. Kozzi scored 120 plus, which was really encouraging for scoring point of view. And I think Lachlan Jones, some question marks around sort of job security, but some of of the indications are positive in terms of a potential round one berth. Now, why don't we start with you, Dunny, and uh, you can let us know about Lachlan Jones before we go throw to, to Faz. What do you reckon as a port supporter? 139,800 means you're paying a premium for him. He's a ready-made player. I actually saw a bit of him last year in the SNFL as uh, his team knocked mine out of the finals, which was another disappointing day. I think the trouble he's going to have is breaking into that back line at Port Adelaide is not easy. He split half and half on the, the weekend with Tom Cleary down back and You've also still got Hamish Hartlett to come back into that side that played on Saturday as well. So I think he's probably battling with potentially Cleary to keep that spot. Tom Cleary's spot comes into question a little bit from last year because we've got Alira Lear now who is taking that extra tall role that Cleary was doing. For me, Jones is probably 60-40 that he plays at the moment. I'm not particularly confident though. He will play games and he will play games early. Kenny's normally pretty good with this stuff. He'll come out early and say who's getting a debut and who isn't. So I'd expect to hear something early in the week before the games start as to whether he's playing or not. He's one just to watch the team sheets for, to be honest. You mentioned Kaczynski there as well with a massive score. He's not going to kick six goals every week, which really inflated his score. He is in my side at the moment. I'm one of the 40.3% that own him, but that's really because I just had no one else to put there at the moment. And just quickly on Highmore as well, I think his job security is probably lifted a little bit with just some of those injuries that St Kilda have got down back at the moment with Frawley out. So... That's probably helped Highmore's chances of getting named, I think. Uh, once again, he's a mature age rookie from the SNFL, so he's played against the big bodies. He knows you know, how to play against the, the men, so I think that should certainly help his role. Whilst Jones has the big body and looks like he's been playing against men for years, he's only 18, but he's a massive unit. Faz, your thoughts on those guys? Just for my confirmation, Danny, Lockie Jones was playing seniors in the sample. Is that right, last year? Yeah, he was playing in the seniors. So I, I agree that he should get some games early. It will just be that question of whether he gets up for round one, a bit of competition for that. It seems like if he is picked, it's the 21st, 22nd player picked in the side. Highmore, I'm a little concerned. I just think that there is a few other guys competing for that spot in St Kilda's side. Jimmy Webster's come back. So there's just a few of, of those sort of medium-sized defenders. If they are looking for sort of a lockdown specialist, I think Highmore might be the, the one that gets the nod. Cozzy, I certainly agree, don't think we'll see scores anything like what he put up on the weekend. 
but Hawthorne are just struggling for bigs down that end of the ground at the moment. I think Mitch Thorpe is out at the moment. Jay Pat's going through some personal issues at the moment, so he's not looking close to selection for right now. So I think Cozzy will get some games. So he's probably the first that I have picked. But that's the worry there is that I'd be a bit worried of going the, a rookie on field with Highmore, Jones, Cozzy. I think Jones potentially has the best scoring potential of the three, but I'm probably the least confident about his job security. And then who knows, a, a young key position player like Cozzy was drafted back in 2018. So he's not a raw 18-year-old, but still uh, key position forwards at that age don't tend to score particularly well. And uh, I think Highmore will be playing a lockdown role. I saw that his metres gained on the weekend from from nine disposals was only 54 metres. I think he's looking to dish off to others to, to do the rebounding. So I, I don't think we're going to see particularly high scores. And I'd be worried that you're could potentially be looking at 40-odd scores between Cozzy and Highmore. So for that reason, I'm trying to rejig my team a bit at the moment to limit it to only two defensive rookies. That's certainly interesting. Brings players like Jordan Clark and Young maybe a little bit more to the fore. We won't go through those guys right now, but maybe one last guy in the back line just to close us off. Nicholas Cox, deaf forward. 176,000 ownership stats have been dropping a little bit, but the talk from Essendon is that kids are probably going to get some games. I haven't looked too closely into it, but I assume that he's a decent chance, Faz, for some early games. What do you reckon as a bomber supporter there, mate? Pretty excited about this kid for the future. He's 200 centimetres, but they've been playing him up on a wing because he's got really good athleticism doesn't seem to be a big accumulator of the ball though he managed to be on the ground for 80 percent of our match against the cats on the weekend nine disposals for 32 points i did see him take a couple of nice intercept marks in in some of the earlier scratch matches in the preseason so i think he might be able to spike one game with a few intercept marks that sort of thing but i'm just worried that you, you are paying a fair bit of a premium there at 175000 given he was pick eight in the draft last year. Uh, I'm just not sure that extra cash is worth it. The one that I've been looking at is Jordan Butts from Adelaide. Played a couple of games last year and scored a 70 on the weekend. So he's at a similar price, 176, right around the Nick Cox range. Did pick up an injury though, rolled an ankle and it's a TBC on the injury list. But uh, if that's a minor one, he's probably the one that I'd be looking at as a bit higher priced rookie that I'd be looking at over Nick Cox. Big price tag, you say? Big butts, huh? <laughs> anyway, juvenile jokes aside, let's go to the midfield. I think the conclusion on the back line is we're light on. So try and not expose yourself to too much risk there. And so just before we leave the back line, I, I would guess Will Gould is mainly teams that were set up early in the preseason and haven't really yeah. logged back in to change their team. But if, if there is anyone out there that's got Will Gould, still in their side, didn't make the extended squad for the preseason match. I'd be looking to get him out of your side and he might be a downgrade option for us later in the season. All right, let's move to the midfield. We might leave the forwards for the forward line, although realistically with the amount of forward mid prices, a fair few of them may end up in the midfield. But we'll have to draw a split somewhere, so we'll go mid only for the midfield. And we'll start off with the two most obvious picks, Tom Powell and Connor Downey, 46.5% and 43.0% of the team. So most highly selected by a while. The next most picked player is Errol Golden for Sydney, who looks to be a fair lock as well in 31.1% of teams. He looks like he's on track to get some early games. Next closest after that, uh, you're looking at Will Phillips in terms of mid-only at 21.3% of teams. More expensively priced to reflect the lower ownership stats, but uh, certainly looks like he may get games and may be a decent scorer. A few sort of more highly picked selections there. Faz, I'm hoping for some good news on the midfield rookie front. What, What do you reckon about... Powell, Downey and and Golden, should they be mostly locked or any concerns around those three? So Powell is the one that I'm most bullish on. Played Sandfall last year, but I believe it was in the Colts, the under-18s, rather than up in the senior division, but was a really good scorer there. I think it was averaging 30-plus disposals a game. So he 
picked up 16 disposals in North's match on the weekend. They're going through that rebuilding phase, so I think they'll put the games into the juniors. Just while we're on North, I saw a comment about Will Phillips with the coach Noble saying that given that Will didn't play any games last year, he's uh, a Victorian pick. They've had to be a bit cautious with him over the preseason and manage the loading with him. So I think he might not get the round one debut. Powell, though, had a pretty uninterrupted season being over with Dunny in South Australia. And uh, so I think he'll come in round one, should score reasonably well, uh, and you're not paying too much of a premium for him at 150000 Very happy with him. Connor Downey, I'm less confident on the scoring for him. I think he'll get games, but I don't think he's as much of an accumulator. Did actually get 17 disposals on the weekend, just to undo my own point. But uh, I think his DT to super coach ratio was quite off. He, he scored, I think it was around the 70 mark in DT for only uh, 40 super coach points. So that's, that seems to be contributed by a lot of handballs rather than kicks. Downey's one that I'd be happy to pick on a bench spot. I wouldn't be as happy with him with an on-field spot. Errol Golden looked pretty decent in the the bits of the Sydney GWS game that I saw. They're also a rebuilding club, so I think he'll be keen to get the games into the youngsters. And yeah, he just seemed to pick up the game pretty well. Was picked 32 in last year's draft. So is that pure rookie. But uh, there was a comment from JPK this week saying that he was one of the hardened bodies, he along with Braden Campbell, who will cover in the forward line. He, he described the two of those as arriving at the club with hardened bodies ready to go. Uh, I think he'll play right off the bat and, yeah, I, I think should score reasonably. I'd be a bit more confident putting him on field than I would be uh, with Connor Downey. I concur with pretty much everything Faz said there. I'm running with Powell and Goulden on field at the moment and Downey on the bench. Two fun facts for you, though, about some of the midfield rookies. Tom Powell, he played uh, under-18s for Sturt in the SNFL last year and by all accounts was outstanding. His old man actually used to play for the Crows. He played a few games for Adelaide. But even more importantly, I used to actually play against him in high school footy, if that shows my age a little bit too much. And the other one was the North Melbourne recruit, Phoenix Spicer. I actually coached him uh, as a junior. Uh, he played for Edwardstown the, and I played with my son in, in that team. And that boy can run and will run all day. And he's played down at South Adelaide. He's been playing under 18s and he also played a few games in the seconds against the seniors as well i'm not sure how much of a game he'll get at north but he certainly can play against the bigger bodies as well but uh, i wouldn't be picking him in my starting side but other than that I agree with everything you said there faz that's cool danny uh you might get the nickname historian or something soon that was pretty cool <laughs> I, love, I like those fun facts faz was there anybody else that you wanted to touch on in the midfield uh in terms of next most picked players and again mid only you've got Tanner for GWS, 15.8% of teams being a higher draft pick from last year. Any other mid-onlys or will we be covering the rest of the realistic options in the forward line? Yeah, at the moment, I've got quite a few of those mid-forwards playing in my midfield right now. As you mentioned, we've got a fair few good just above rookie priced mid prices in the forward line. Joe Danaher types, pour some out for <laughs> the old boy there. I'm probably looking at playing a few of the, the mid forwards up in the midfield just for that reason. Tanner Braun, I'm not quite sure he's worth the extra price. He scored 62 on the weekend from 82% game time, but he did kick four goals. 62 points from four goals has me a little worried because you know, you're know you not going to see that every week. Uh, and if that's the the scoring output with such a good game, I'd be concerned that it, it, he's not going to have that each week. Uh, I'm also not sure that he fits into the, that GWS side. I think they're a bit thin down back, but midfield and forward, they're probably a bit better stocked. Tanner Braun's not one that's come into my side at all this preseason. All right, we'll move, I guess, just to recap on the rock. You've got Tracy, Flynn, Hunter, and Meek. Hunter, potentially with uh, questionable job security. Meek in only 9.7% of teams, but may... Uh, usurp Tracy uh, in his showing across the weekend. Flynn and Meek, probably the the top two in terms of most talked about in the Twitter community and which tends to be the most on pulse with these most recent changes across the last few days. Tracy, if he still does get up, may be a reasonable consideration up forward so that if you are running a rookie R2 and Tracy comes through, but one of those 
to Flynn Hunter or Meek doesn't come through in your rucks, you have the opportunity to pivot and have some backup security there to a forward rookie. I think that summarizes it reasonably well without needing to go into the details of those ruck rookies, which um, we may leave for, for a future or Patreon show and maybe just head into the forward line because we've got probably a fair bit to cover there. Now, number one most obvious pick in the forward line uh, or in rookie wide is probably James Rowe for Adelaide, uh, who will play games, especially with Stengel out initially. Questionable in terms of more medium-term job security, but you'd think a guy in the slot with a position to lose is probably... Um, enough considering the the mature age as well. Uh, The next one, Braden Campbell, uh, is probably next most locked, 40.6% of teams, probably one that if you're paying extra dollars for being a a top pick from last year, you want to actually have on field. One that most people outside of Powell are a bit more excited to actually pay the money for. He seems pretty locked for me in terms of an on-field position. Where he'll play remains to be seen in terms of mid slash forwards. Paddy Dow, we've already talked about so we won't go through him again but after that faz we've got tyler brockman mid forward for hawthorne 30.5 percent of teams finlay mccray mid forward for collingwood 27.6 percent of teams alex waterman who certainly shot up 22.7 percent of teams having been signed by essendon in the ssp period corey durden isaac chug the next two highest uh, in 18.4 and 14.9 but they started a lot higher in the preseason probably indicative of guys who've slipped down the order and then we're getting into the anthony scott eli smith kieran briggs there's more names in the forward line than potentially other positions. Fortunately, a lot of mid forwards, which we're probably looking to push power type on field for. What's your takeaway in the forward line, Faz, in terms of where you're likely to go at this stage? Just uh, flicking over a quick look at my side. I've, I've currently got Rowe and Tracy sitting on the bench, looking at that that option, as you mentioned, in the ruck line. It, oftentimes, it can be hard to find the downgrade for your ruck. So Tracy there as the pivot him into the rucks and that, that lets you downgrade and get the cash for a Flynn or whoever it is that you have at R3 or potentially at R2. Warner is another one that uh, I don't know if he made the, the list there. Yeah, um, yeah Chad Warner at, at the Swans played a couple of games last year, didn't score a heap, only averaged 34, but he had 89 points from 19 disposals on the weekend. One of the trio of uh, Swan rookies that I have at the moment along with Braden Campbell and Errol Golden. Certainly think that Braden Campbell should be a good scorer. He was rated as the best kick in last year's draft. Swans are looking to play him on that rebounding halfback role, potentially filling the Callum Mills spot with him moving up into the midfield. So I, I expect him to be quite a good scorer and be worth the extra cash. So then in terms of the other names that we're looking at, Finlay McRae, not as keen on him. Didn't play in the preseason game. I think he might have been picked on the bench but didn't actually see any playing time in the game i'd say that that probably doesn't spell good things for him playing round one archie perkins at essendon i don't think he's worth the extra cash there's been some good comments about how he's looked over the preseason but i think he might be a bit raw he's a victorian and only drafted last year had a year out of footy essentially last year alec waterman i think he'll be touch and go to make the round one side if he does get in he'll be very tempting with that price point of 102000 But he was one of those late sub-on players that we mentioned earlier. I think he only came on in the last quarter. So, uh, again, I think that probably doesn't spell great things for him being a round one starter. If you were looking at Essendon players, I think the ones that I'd be looking at more closely would be... You've got Harrison Jones, who was 30th pick in the 2019 draft. So he's had a year in, an, in the AFL system. Essendon's forward line has a few big holes in it now. All of the problems that come with a young key position forward, I don't think he's going to be a great scorer, but the club should put some games into him. So if you're looking at somebody to just sort of park on the forward bench, you can certainly do worse than Harrison Jones. Ned Cahill's another one. People might remember him played a few games last year. Very small fella, so it doesn't necessarily look like his body can handle AFL footy, but the club seem to be wanting to turn him into a, a rebounding defender. And that's a spot that Essen have, again, have some holes in the, you know, that probably applies to just about every spot on the field for, for Essendon. But with the loss of Adam Saad and Connor McKenna heading back to Ireland, there, there is, I think, a spot up for grabs as that rebounding defender. And the guys that have been filling that role in sort of a Mason Redmond or 
Matt Guelfi, uh, I think that Ned Cahill could win that spot and make it his own. He's at 160000 so that's just the question whether he's worth the extra money. But he, he played 83% of the preseason game, only 52 points, but could be a fairly lucrative scoring role, as we mentioned earlier, that rebounding defender. Yeah, Ned's one that I'm, I'm looking at, not currently in my side, but could make his way in there. So, I mean, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like we've got riches with the rookies this year, which was our suspicion heading into this preseason. And unfortunately, looking like it's panning out a little bit that way. They're mid forwards that we want to put in the midfield to push more reliable rookies on field. The back line is a struggle. The forward line, once you push some of the forward rookies into the midfield, you're all of a sudden looking at Rowe and Tracy in your forward bench. This is why the Ruck 2 rookie is suddenly becoming potentially a little bit more attractive and potentially makes me backtrack some of the stuff I was saying around Jarman and Impey types because if you don't have reliable rookies, you may have to pay a little bit more just to get bodies on field. So it's going to be a fairly dynamic team sheet period. Hopefully we get more people being kind to us like Ken Hinckley and just not bullshitting us and telling us when people <laughs> get games. So kudos to your team, Dunny, and I uh, hope he keeps it up for, for season 2021. Any sort of final thoughts that you want to wrap up the rookies with, Dunny, and, and how you're going to approach things for lockout? I, I'll probably approach it the same way I normally do, Marcus, and that is have lots of placeholders in there, not the bargain basement, not the 102,000 placeholders, but putting in 123, uh, you know, 130K players and waiting to see what happens with team sheets more than anything else. The biggest advice I could give the listeners is have those guys that you think you want to play in your team, but have two or three others just waiting in the wings just in case your guy falls out uh, and gets them in there. Don't panic and pick up a guy who's playing for Richmond uh, who we've never heard of, no one's spoken about all preseason in that first game. We all remember Relton with great love, but just don't panic. There will be other players pop up. Do your research. Make sure you, you have a look at those the team sheets, but more importantly, just don't panic is probably the biggest bit of advice that I'll give. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. I think that's good advice, uh, especially considering the fluid nature. Uh, you don't want to be panicking into poor decisions. Faz, you've done very well, mate, for the rookie expert. I think you upheld your status there. But you can have the last word on the rookies, mate, and any final advice there. Oh, thank you very much. I guess it, it remains to be seen. I, 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 I won't go <laughs> too much until we've hit downgrade season and some of these picks have, have actually paid off. So yeah, I certainly think that's a great point that you made there, Dunny, in terms of looking at your placeholder players. And yeah, I think the selection numbers for guys like the Isaac Chug, Alex Davies, I think reflect people being a little greedy with, oh, if I just put a few other $102,000 rookies in here, that can get me up to a Paddy Danger field that gets me up to Max Gorn. I think that's where you'll get yourself in trouble. Rolling lockout plus rolling team uh, sheet announcements for for round one i think you want to leave yourself a bit of room and and maybe in addition to what dunny suggested leave a bit of cash in there uh, and then have a bit of a luxury upgrade that you're looking at ideally with players that are playing on the sunday in round one so just quickly to read that out that's north port adelaide gws st kilda west coast and gold coast let's just to pick names out of a hat if you're looking at maybe you're not convinced on matt rowell after his performance in the preseason if you're thinking oh wouldn't mind going Matt Rowell up to one of the West Coast midfielders, figure out how much money that's going to cost, have that sitting there in the bank. And then if the rookies fall apart and you need to go up to a Nick Cox, Ned Cahill, some of the guys that are higher priced, not necessarily going to score as well, but at least they might have better job security. You've got the money sitting there ready to go because if you're trying to rejig the whole team, I think that's where where everything could fall apart. All right. To our listeners, uh, on behalf of them, thank you too for joining us. Uh, I think the good amount of time we recorded for reflects the great thoughts that you guys have that we've not been able to pick through the preseason so far, so I'm sure the community are really appreciative of that. Final bit from me is just uh, if you're into your super coach, bloody cancel your plans next weekend because it's going to be a nightmare <laughs> trying to be dynamic with this stuff. If you go for a birthday party, cancel it. Don't plan anything large during the weekend. Let your family know you're about to be uh, unattentive. <laughs> Set expectations low. Better to... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Better to overachieve in that regard. We'll be back with one more show, hopefully, before the end of the preseason. We'll see how we go. Uh, I think Bryce, long-time guest again, is potentially free 
next week. So we'll, we're a bit fluid, but we'll see uh, what we can do from a content point of view. And for our patrons, we're going to do a, a quick show now. With that, <laughs> we'll sign off so we can get on to that. Uh, we'll catch you all at least one more time before the preseason ends. See you soon.